16th. The topic of our workshop tonight is achievement centers. We're doing it in this format because it may very well have budgetary implications for us. We're going to begin tonight with a few comments by Patty Grennan, who is president of the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation. Welcome, Patty, and I think probably Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. Um, Chairman Sweeney, thank you um, for inviting me here this evening. Um, and fellow school board members, um, thank you as well. Um, as you said, my name is Patty Grennan, and I am president of the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, also known as CEF, in the community. And I wanted um, to thank you for inviting us here tonight to hear Jeff Shedd's proposal um, to open an achievement center at the high school this coming fall. Um, as you may know, CEF is an independent, nonprofit organization of community members that are committed to fostering innovation and excellence in Cape Elizabeth schools. Um, and we do this in three ways, by building community-wide support for our schools, by partnering with the district to help it achieve its vision of becoming one of the top schools in the U.S., and by funding initiatives that fall outside of the school budget. And by, by that, we mean um, initiatives that help set new standards and initiatives that help our students here in Cape Elizabeth become um, amongst the best prepared students in the United States. Um, it was almost a year ago when the Cape um, Foundation looked at how we might um, begin this partnership with the district and how we could be a, a catalyst and bring a new um, initiatives forward. And what we did is we decided that we would contact the district leadership team, the leaders within the district, and ask them what or to identify their um, highest priorities of unmet needs to achieve their vision. And at this meeting, um, you might, many of you are here, you might remember there were 30 to 35 ideas, and it was really incredible um, energy that went on. Um, upon our request, the DLT narrowed it to four um, priorities. We considered these four ideas uh, versus our mission, vision, and grant criteria. And then we decided to invite these four members of the DLT to present at our annual ret retreat. And it was here that CEF's directors heard of the potential impact an achievement center would have on all of Cape's high school students. And it was here that they had first expressed interest in funding this priority. I have to tell you that all of us at CEF that are here this evening um, and all of us on our board are thrilled to be here to show our support for Jeff Shedd's proposal. Um, recently, as you might know, um, members of CEF met with Bob Lyman, Jeff Shedd, and members of your school board to discuss a potential partnership with the district and stated that we would fund a percentage of the Achievement Center if it were fully embraced by the school board and if it were fully embraced by the community. Um, it is our hope that you will be as jazzed as CEF's board members are about this innovative initiative. And it is our hope that the Achievement Center will receive your full support so that it can open its doors this fall and it could open its doors to help all Cape's children become amongst the best prepared students in the United States. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your coming to me. We appreciate all your assistance as well as all the good work going towards uh, enhancing this partnership. I think Bob Lyman, our, our interim superintendent, has a few opening remarks and then we'll get right into the presentation of uh, Thank you, Kevin. Um, <coughs> it is not every year that a great idea comes along. Education is pretty stoic. Education is pretty um, conservative. There aren't a lot of changes that take place. With the learning results, with the idea of focusing on every child, has come the idea that we need to focus on every child and we need to provide programs to make sure that each one can succeed. This is one of those ideas, and it's not just a high school idea. What we're talking about here tonight is a high school part. What CEF and what the DLT has talked about is a three to five year plan for, to impact the entire school district to make sure that every kid 
whether they're a kindergartner, a fifth grader, a sixth grader, an eighth grader, a twelfth grader, is getting the, what they need to help them be successful. And that's a whole different idea from simply taking X number of courses and going from there. So I'm really excited about it. I think it's a, an interesting proposal. We've worked hard in our budget preparation to make room for this to happen. That has meant having to cut down in some other areas. You'll hear all about that about two weeks from now. But we think it's that important that we're willing to look at those kinds of um, decreases to make sure that every student gets the help they need coming through the district, starting with the high school um, center and going from there, working down through the ranks to make sure that other levels get their uh, help too. So with that, I'd just like to uh, um, turn it over to Jeff and let him explain to all of you what this is all about. You will all be getting in a few minutes um, sort of a, a full handout. I have what is, what is something that's clearly prepared in PowerPoint, but I decided not to present it as a PowerPoint. Sometimes that's a little bit overdone, but I think the format is a useful format. And I apologize right at the beginning. I don't have one of these for everybody because I managed to drop them all on the wet uh, road outside just as I was getting out of my car. Uh, but Mary is copying them upstairs, so she'll have a few more in just a little bit. Um, I've got a few dry ones. Um, first of all, I want to thank the board um, for setting up this special time, um, taking time out of your day, which I know is, a, is not a regularly scheduled meeting of the school board. Um, I think it's, it's really great that the board and the individual members of the board are willing to do that. Um, I want to thank the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation um, uh, for very much um, for being willing to sort of pitch in in a very substantial way, we hope, uh, to help, to help a, uh, an achievement center become a reality in the high school. My job is really to do sort of a, a, an explanation and a sales pitch, um, and it's, it's one of the more delightful opportunities I've had um, compared to talking about uh, roofs and building renovations and a lot of other things that we talk about from time to time and student disciplinary issues. Uh, it's a pleasure to come and, and talk about and be able to focus on some real, um, real concrete learning issues and proposals to get at some issues that uh, the board and we have recognized for a long time are, are, are very real at the high school. And basically, in, in a nutshell, uh, what, I'm, what I'm pitching tonight is, is, a, is a provision that would be created in the high school, hopefully, hopefully in some capacity, probably not in exactly the same capacity that, I, that I'll be explaining it today, eventually in the sim somewhat comparable uh, provisions in the, in the middle school and in the elementary school, um, an opportunity uh, that I think has the potential to raise achievement for all Cape Elizabeth High School students, uh, from our top students to our weakest students, um, largely by taking advantage of time that already exists in our school day, which is for the most part, not entirely, uh, but for the most part underutilized if not wasted, which is study hall time. Um, and so that the idea is to use this time to deliver individualized instruction to students to support them in, in achieving whatever their goals are for themselves and their parents' goals are for them. And I want to talk for a second about Keep Elizabeth High School and why is Keep Elizabeth High School of all places proposing an achievement center. And I have to say at the outset that um, this is not an original idea. Um, I mean, I thank Bob for his kind comments, but. Um, there are lots of high schools and lots of other schools around the state who have one version or another of achievement centers, learning centers, writing centers. The basic idea is that during the school day, uh, there is time for students to get individualized instructional support. Um, but why Cape Elizabeth High School and why now? Um, I brought a couple of visual aids to sort of raise a question. 
and because I want to show it off. This year, um, as the board knows, um, Doug Worthley, a high school science teacher, and I went down to Washington, D.C., and we presented a Blue Ribbon Award for Cape Elizabeth High School. No child left behind Blue Ribbon School. Now, our, our elementary, this year, our, our, our high school happened to receive that. Our elementary school and middle school would be equally deserving to receive the, this award or similar award at those grade levels based on the performance of those students. Um, we also received two certificates from the state, uh, one for excellence on the MEA in reading over the past several years, and another one for excellence on the MEA in mathematics over the past several years. Um, our students perform among the top few almost every single year, a few public high schools in every single area that the MEA tests, reading, writing, mathematics, science. Used to teach, used to test social studies as well. It doesn't do that. Um, used to test the arts. Our, our students perform at the top. I think they even perform relative to the state even higher um, on standardized tests that actually count like the SATs, uh, the ones that count for college entrance. Um, so why, why does Cape Elizabeth High School, which already performs really well when you compare us to other schools across the state and even across the nation in many cases, why do we need something like an achievement center? Um, and the answer really is, it has two parts. And one is uh, the state of Maine learning results. Um, and this is, and the school board members have seen this purple book or violet book, whatever color this is. I'm a little bit color challenged. But this is a description, a detailed blow-by-blow -blow description of what some people have determined in English, math, science, social studies, health, and PE students need to have if they want to be able to get a diploma from any high school in the state, starting with this year's ninth grade class. Um, it's no longer good enough that students accumulate credits for three years in math, or four years in English, or two years in science, or for whatever it might be. They have to demonstrate this knowledge. And if they don't, they don't get a diploma. Um, and, so, and the other part of what we're finding, and the individual schools across the state are responsible for assessing how the kids are doing. And we are doing as the best job we can to try to create an assessment system that does that. It's not fully in place, but one thing is certain is that we are not going to be able to give diplomas to all the members, all the students who come into Cape Elizabeth High School just because on average we score at the top of the state on the MEAs or the SATs or the ACTs or any other standardized test. We're only going to be able to give them to the students who have met the requirements in the learning results. And if you look at our most recent MEA test results, uh, which I have here, our students do great compared to other schools. But um, we have, of our students who go to Cape Elizabeth High School right now, um, and I'm getting older and my, my eyesight is less and less focused all the time, but we have in English in writing, uh, we have 52% of our kids who by the MEA measure, which I'm quite skeptical about, in a lot of different ways, but it's the only measure we have right now. Only 52% of our kids, by this measure, meet the learning results that exist that our kids have to pass in writing in four years. Um, and we do better than anybody else, almost anybody else. Um, in reading, we have 71% of our kids who meet the learning results according to the MEAs which means 29% of our kids do not. Um, in mathematics, where we are typically one of the top one or two schools, public schools, um, and that's been recognized for a long time, we have only 58% of our kids who either meet or exceed the learning results according to the measure of the MEAs. And in science and technology, we have an even longer way to go. Um, according to the latest MEA results, 27% of our students either meet or exceed the learning results according to the MEA exams. So even in Cape Elizabeth High School, if we operate from the only measure that we have right now, in many ways it's a flawed measure, but it's what we've got, the only game in town at this moment, we still have a long way to go. 
before all of our students are up to the level that the learning results requires them to be at. And in, in addition to that, um, quite apart from the learning results, there is no question that even students who meet or exceed the standards of the learning results as measured by the MEAs, even many of those are not achieving their potential and that they are wasting some time even while they are in a high-performing school at Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, before I get into specifics of describing an achievement center, I want to state a few caveats at the outset. First of all, and most importantly, I think, um, the, the achievement center is not a replacement for the most important thing that we have going for us within our building that explains why our kids do well. Because the most important thing that we have going for us is we have a really excellent and caring teaching staff. Um, our teachers spend countless hours above and beyond their assigned times helping kids, trying to get kids up to the level that they need to get at. And an achievement center will not replace that effort and is less important in many ways than that effort. But the reality of teacher time and student time is this. Our students typically have either one out of eight of our periods or two out of eight of our periods in our school schedule as study hall time. Our teachers, likewise, have only two out of eight periods unscheduled, essentially their personal preparation time. So I should have asked Roger Rio, our statistics teacher. That either means that there is a one in four likelihood that our, our teachers and our students who need help will be available at the same time, or it's one in 16 if it's one fourth by one fourth. I'm not sure, but it's clearly not a majority likelihood that our students who need help and our teachers who are their teachers in their classes will be available at any given time to help them. Um, and then when you think about how active our students are after school, um, you can understand why as many students as we serve after school through the individual teachers, there are still many who don't get uh, the attention that they need after school, either because they don't have time or when they're done with school, they're done with school. Um, and that is true even in Cape Elizabeth High School, particularly as kids get older and go, and go through the process. Um, so increasingly, learning results and standards-based education is leading to a conclusion that I've reached and I think most educators are reaching, and that is that we cannot afford to have in the student schedule the amount of wasted time that we have or the amount of underutilized time that we have. And so we have to find a way to capture that time and make it educationally more valuable than it is for many students at this point. Um, and on the, on the title page of this um, handout that I've given to you, you see what, I'm ta what I talk about is a, a, the, the Achievement Center really represents a new model. Again, it's not my idea. It's not original with me, but it it's represents the very simple idea that what we need to do, instead of lowering our expectations for students, because we're not able to do that now, we have to change the time. Time has got to be the variable, and different and individualized instruction has to be the variable. No longer can standards or expectations be the variable. So I'm going to walk through this fairly quickly. Um, Kevin, I don't know, how, but I, I would be more than open to questions as I go along, or if, you, if you'd prefer, you, um, I'll just keep on rattling along, and then you can ask questions when, when we're done. That's certainly your preference. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Just, you, you I'll rattle. Somebody's uh, I will rattle until stuff. Um, the second page of this uh, really talks about uh, what I've called the traditional model um, where academic standards are the variable. <clears throat> um, and under that system, basically what happens in order to graduate, the traditional model is, just as it was when I went through high school or you went through high school, we all got diplomas, is we had to do four years of English, three years of math. Didn't matter what levels of math it was, but three years of math. Two years of science, we now have three at the high school. But it didn't matter what the science was, it just had to be two years of science. And on and on and on and on, whether in art and technology or health and PE or those sorts of things. Um, and the students followed, because the schools created, a lockstep structure in which all the periods for every class were the same. So the length of time was the same. 
So in order for students to have a chance to be able to meet the standards, because we obviously have many, many different students who have different learning abilities, different processing speeds, and all of those other things that we learn about, the way that schools have traditionally responded when faced with students who naturally were going to take more time to learn, because they didn't have more time, they tended to lower the standards. Um, and that's just a reality. That's not anything new at Cape Elizabeth High School. We all experienced that. We all went through high schools that, that did that. Um, Standards-based education, moving on, um, the real difference is that standards are not the variable, expectations are not the variable, they are fixed. They're not negotiable, kids have got to do them. So the time then becomes the variable. Um, and I think I've belabored, I think I beat that one to death. Uh, I'm not going to go beyond that. Um, There were and are, there, there, there continue to be some traditional responses uh, that schools have uh, when there are students who need more time or more individualized instruction. And one of those responses is called special education. And one of the ways that special education works is by taking that study hall time, taking kids out of regular study halls and putting them in more structured study halls that are geared towards supporting them in their learning. So in many ways, special education has sort of recognized what I'm talking about for many, 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 many years. Private tutoring is another one. Uh, and that happens in Cape Elizabeth more than I'd like to admit. We have kids who are being tutored in math and science and English and foreign languages and just about everything. Um, so there's that time that's outside of the school. And then there is time um, which sometimes borders on the excessive um, that parents spend with their students. Um, and sometimes that creates some issues at the high school trying to figure out whose work are we looking at. Are we looking at the students' work or are we looking at the parents' work? Um, but that is a very natural response of parents, and I hope that it continues. We just need to continue to find the, the right boundaries. And, and the Achievement Center is not going to replace the need for this either. Uh, but it is what people do. Um, and then there are students who just kill themselves and beat themselves up out of school uh, and just work like crazy. Um, some students will spend three and four hours a night accomplishing what other students take an hour, an hour a night or a half an hour a night to accomplish. Um, so there's all kinds of responses, um, but there are none that are really outside of special education. There are none that are really sort of built into the structure of the school. So as I mentioned, what I want to do, what the proposal is about, is capturing study hall time. Now, not all study hall time is wasted. Some students use it really, really diligently. But I would suggest that probably all students don't use it diligently all the time. And many students don't use it diligently much of the time. Um, so there is a large pool of untapped time, underutilized time, um, that can be put to much more effective use. And under our current schedule, just so you have an idea of what I'm talking about, um, 40 to 50 percent, I didn't get the exact numbers, but 40 to 50 percent of our students take six classes out of the eight periods that we have offered. So for those students who take six classes, and everybody is required to take at least six, those students have two study halls. That means one fourth of their time in the high school is in study hall. Uh, most of the rest, the vast majority of the rest of the students um, take seven classes, or some take six and a half. They'll take six four-year classes in a semester class. So there are different, but for the most part, on average, the other half approximately of the students have one study hall in eight periods. So more than 15% of their time is in unstructured, supervised, but not necessarily as productive as it could be time. There are a very tiny handful, and I'm pretty sure I could count them on two hands, students who have no study halls. That requires special permission by the principal, um, so it doesn't happen unless I know about it. I know I haven't signed too many, and there's not too many kids who ask. There are a few every year, and there will continue to be. <coughs> um, and as I mentioned, there is much study hall time that is unproductive. So if you go to the next page, the premise of the Achievement Center is to use study hall time for structured individualized learning. And as I mentioned, there is nothing new in this idea. Cape Elizabeth is not a pioneer in this area. 
Um, I just did a quick informal survey uh, of a number of high schools, and every single one that I talked to had some, some version of an of a achievement center. Falmouth does, Yarmouth does, Freeport does, Greeley does, Mount Everett does, many, many others do. Um, and one of the things that other states are finding out, and it is common sense, uh, but sometimes educational research has to confirm common sense, um, states that have high stakes assessments geared to their own particular educational standards, for example in Massachusetts, have clearly found that the most effective time to give educational support to kids is during school. For example, I've read of a number of schools in Massachusetts who tried to offer um, additional structured assistance to students after school. And there's a very tiny percentage of students who took advantage of it, even though a diploma was on the line for them. Um, a slightly higher percentage, I think, do take advantage of summer school opportunities. But by far, the greatest percentage take advantage of time which is available during the school day. Um, and so that's what this is all about. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, absolutely. You said a tiny handful has no study ball. Apparently, I miss your rationale for that. Some students just like to drive themselves, and they want to take eight classes. They want to take a class every single period. Um, there aren't too many of those, um, and we try to monitor them as best we can to make sure they're staying uh, mentally healthy. Um, but, but the number is fairly small. But that, that's what that was about. Okay, um, what I'm going to describe here is sort of um, my vision of what an achievement center can be, depending on what happens with the budget, depending on what happens with the staffing, depending on what happens with some other realities um, as we begin something. This may not be exactly what it looks like, but I think the model um, would be the starting point, and I think it is realistic. Um, and first of all, I want to address where would an achievement center be, because an achievement center would be a place. It'd be a room in the high school. Um, and if those of you who are familiar with the layout of the high school know if you know where the guidance office is, if you walk in on the, the third floor, which is the floor that you walk into when you come into the main entrance of the high school, the guidance office, the main office is just to your right, and the guidance office is the big office to your left. Well, now that our kindergarten um, friends have departed, we miss them, but now that they have departed, um, the guidance office is going to, um, in fact, we've already occupied their rooms. <laughs> They're being used already. Um, but now that they are leaving, the guidance office is being relocated to a space um, that ex exists in what was the kindergarten wing. So the guidance office is being demolitioned, and there are two rooms that are being created out of that. One is going to be a classroom space, and one, which is going to be the space that's right on the main lobby of the school, will be a space which is where I contemplate that an achievement center would be. Um, so it would be in a very prominent location in the school. Um, everybody would be able to see um, that this is where it exists. It would be a welcoming place, and I wanted to give you a sense of you know, physically where in the school this, this thing would be located. Uh, but basically, uh, the steps that I see that students who walk into the, to the achievement center, the services that they will get is, first of all, we've got to figure out what, what the issues are. What are, the, what are the goals that the student has that brings them into the, into the Achievement Center? What are the goals that the parents have for the students? What are the students' grades in the classes? What are the teachers saying about what the students need? What are the diagnostic tests telling us the student is, is where their strengths and weaknesses are? Whether it's the MEAs, or as I propose as part of this plan, the ACTs. Um, or a whole bunch of different things to sort of use the tools that we have, many of which already exist but are not frankly used in as systematic a way as we should be using them, to identify what the students' needs are so that we can begin to boost their achievement. So it's diagnosis, it's development of a plan for the student, here's where we are, here's where we want to go, and then talking about how do we get there. Um, and then regular intermediate assessment and feedback on achievement, um, and then for students, and there are an increasing number of them, many of them are boys, but not all boys, who are not particularly strong at organizational related things or attention related things, whether they have a formal diagnosis related to that or not, uh, to have 
a service within the Achievement Center that would act as a person who was an expert at keeping, helping kids keep organized and helping them to learn how to keep themselves organized. Moving on to the next page, who would use the Achievement Center? One of the things that I've tried to craft is to try to stay true to the idea that the Achievement Center is not just for our most needy academic kids, but it is something that can benefit everybody. Um, and that is a place where teachers go for training and not just students. So one of the things that I proposed is that the, the Achievement Center would be the location where teachers would go if they wanted to get any technology-related training. For example, use of some of the programs that are on the laptops. Um, use of any, any programs, use of our grading software, use of our administrative software packages, any kind of technology-related training um, that that would happen in the Achievement Center. I've also proposed, um, and I'll get into a little bit more depth about this a little bit later, um, I wanted to have something, and so I stole I, an idea from a couple of different schools that I'm familiar with, that actually have a writing center. In other words, it's a place where when the students are assigned a major writing project, whether it's in English or history or science or whatever it might be, part of the writing process that they have to go through before they submit a, a final draft to their teachers is to go to the writing center and get a writing conference with somebody who's trained the conference about students' writing. Um, and that can be teachers. I also envision that it can be trained community volunteers. Uh, Cape Elizabeth certainly has a wealth of both retired, non-retired, non-working people who could really help kids out. Um, take a second look or a third look or a fourth look at their writing and provide some assistance. Um, and then tutoring um, in any subject area beyond what teachers can provide. Um, and I say beyond, in any subject area confidently because I am not going to, I'm not proposing that in the Achievement Center at any one time there will be a Spanish teacher and an English teacher and a math teacher and a history teacher because there's no way I could possibly do that. And it would cost a fortune. Um, <coughs> and the CIF would have to mortgage, mortgage its next 10 years of donations in order to make that happen. Um, but what I am proposing is to take advantage of some technology which exists now, which is used in a lot of places to provide instruction to kids on an individualized basis. Um, last year when we were looking um, at a support provision for students which has sort of evolved into the Achievement Center, a number of us went up to Lewiston Vocational Regional Technical Center. Um, and they have what they call a Plato learning lab. And Plato is an instructional software um, which offers an individualized instruction and assessment to kids in all grade levels, K through 12. Everything, for example, in mathematics from compu basic computation arithmetic up to calculus. Um, they offer sciences at all kinds of different grade levels. They offer reading, instructional, writing, writing support. Um, it, I'm not sure they have foreign language, um, but, but they're really well known and they're really used in a lot of different places. In fact, we have a couple of teachers in the high school who came from other schools where they did use Play-Doh and they've talked about how it worked really well for their kids. And when we were at, vocation, at Lewiston, it was amazing to go into Lewiston um, and see in this Play-Doh learning lab, because they have about 20 licenses for Play-Doh, which means that 20 kids at any one time can be on a module of Plato getting instructional support. Um, kids with headphones on, sort of going through, depending on what their particular strengths and weaknesses are, um, learning on this system. And there were kids, there were kids learning anything from English as a second language, because Lewiston struggles with a lot of kids who didn't grow up native English speakers, um, to mathematics, to typing, to a whole bunch of different things. Um, Plato is extensively used in Massachusetts and a whole bunch of different states. Um, and I've got names of a number of schools who use it um, in Massachusetts and a whole lot of different, different places if the board would like some more information and um, from, from other schools that do use it. Um, and then students who are behind in credit. Um, they need to catch up with their classmates. Um, I don't see that as the major use of the Achievement Center at the beginning for kids taking, for example, whole courses, only because our resources are going to be limited. Um, and I'm not sure how many kid, kids we could afford to do that for, 
but I think that could be a small percentage of the clientele, and certainly there are students who need that assistance. All right. Um, I've said that all students would at some point or another use the services of the Achievement Center. Um, and that's true with the writing conferences. It's true with kids who want to simply refer themselves. Maybe they want to uh, increase their vocabulary in preparation for the SAT or whatever. But I also anticipate that there are some students for whom participation in the Achievement Center would be mandatory. Um, as part of our job to try to make sure that they have a decent, fair chance of getting a diploma at the end of four years. Um, and I put on this next page, um, sort of a, a list of the kinds of things that I could see would trigger a mandatory involvement of a student in the Achievement Center. And one would be a referral by the CAPE Assistance Team. Uh, at the last board meeting, I talked for a few minutes about what the CAPE Assistance, te Assistance Team does and what its role is, so I'm not going to go into that. Uh, a pattern of poor homework performance uh, reported by teachers, students who may be good students, may be exceptionally bright, but they have this sacred belief that when they get home, School is done for them, and so they don't do anything. Um, and the Achievement Center can help to break that belief. Or maybe it allows them to still be true to their beliefs, but still get some of their work done anyway. Um, low scores on the ACT family of tests. And I'm going to explain this in a little bit more depth a little bit later, but I am proposing a series of diagnostic tests that are part of the ACT testing system which is a competitor to the College Board's SAT system. Low scores on the MEAs, um, low scores on the learning results assessments that the high school is giving um, as kids go through our math, English, science, and social studies and health and PE courses. Um, referral by a parent, screen through guidance. And I would also say referral by students themselves to the extent that we can, we can serve those students as well. And I certainly hope that we can. Um, then I want to, then I'm going back and I'm sort of um, trying to go through this a little bit more step by step. Step one is to diagnose, to look at grades, teacher reports, standardized tests, as I mentioned. Um, we have a number of softwares, as I mentioned, that are geared, for example, to give a quick read on what a student's reading comprehension level is, or what grade level they are in terms of their reading. Um, that would be housed in the Achievement Center and would be an important tool because I think there are probably two things that are more correlated to poor performance in high school, high school anyway, than anything else. And one is poor reading, um, and the other is just really bad organization um, or not keeping up with the day to day work. Step two on the next page is the plan for the individual student. Come up with an individual plan, come up with some achievement goals that are achievable in a time frame. Um, and then to meet with the parents and the students um, and come to an understanding that this is what's going to happen for the next three weeks, for the next month, for the next two months, twice a week, once a week, whatever it is, your student will be coming into the Achievement Center during period C, and this is what they'll be working towards. Step three is delivery. Uh, deliver the instructional support. Um, this could be by subject area tutors. Um, I still have some talking with teachers to do about how much, to what extent I can get teachers infiltrated into the Achievement Center as tutors. Um, it's gonna, it requires some creativity in our scheduling and some other things, but it's an issue that I've been talking about. Um, but certainly I see the possibility of subject area tutors who are also volunteers um, and subject and others, and, and then the Plato software itself. Organizational coaches, computer instruction using Plato software. Now, the next, the next series of, of slides that you're getting, not in slide format, but on your hands out, um, is about the Play-Doh software. Um, and I've been given permission by the Play-Doh folks to sort of show you some of the stuff that they have, so you have a sense of what this looks like. Um, Play-Doh software is um, all these things that the company says it is. Although I will say at the outset, <clears throat> that the slides that they give, that they give to me and that they give to other people in their sales presentations and things, um, they're giving their snazziest stuff to us. Um, not everything is in Plato is equally at the same level of quality. Most is really quite good quality. Social studies is a little bit weak, and I can say that as an old social studies teacher. 
it's not it's not quite as strong they're working on um, improving that and they continually work to update what, what they offer um, but Plato software is, can be age appropriate because it's so varied individualized and all these things that I put down here um, and Plato does it works essentially by giving the students a pre-assessment having the students work work delivering some worksheets and work that the student the student um, completes. In fact, the next slide shows this. Um, there's, there's no magic to this model of instruction that Plato uses. This is what a computer can do. This is the way computers will work. Um, and this slide shows how it works, for example, with, um, with math. Um, they, there is an overall arching curriculum. Um, and then there is a course, for example, fractions. And then there are various modules within fractions depending on, depending on what the student's particular needs are. The students listen to the tutorial after taking a pre-assessment. They do drill, they do application. Some of it is quite creative, some of it is quite interactive, some of it is less so. Um, they, are given, they are given opportunities to practice and then they take a mastery test. And then Plato keeps a record of where the student is in any particular area and can produce for the adults who are in charge of the Achievement Center a report, very detailed reports that show how the student is doing. The next several slides are just pictures of some of the sort of screenshots from some of the software that is included within Plato. The first uh, is some of the vocabulary instruction. Um, in fact, the first couple are vocabulary instruction. Um, the next one is from science, chemistry in particular. Um, and what, what this actually is, the one that has a picture of the Bunsen burner and the beaker and the, whatever that other thing is, looks like a big, I can't remember what that's called. Um, what that actually is, it's an interactive simulated experiment. So there are a series of instructions to the student, do this, do this, do this, and the student uses the keyboard to command Plato to do various things, and then they keep data. Um, so it is, it is an ex experimental simulation that the student is actually running through, and then they can do some data analysis and they have to answer questions and problems. Um, the next couple of slides are just pictures of some of the biology, um, science, um, software, support software that they have. The next one is the one that uh, talks about this investigation too from Algebra 2. That again is an interactive um, instructional um, part in Algebra 2 where the students have to actually manipulate the, the, um, uh, the angles within the ellipse to demonstrate certain ratios and formulas and other things that are important to an understanding of Algebra 2. Um, and then the equation, they work with equations and do all those sorts of things. The next page is just an example of the kind of report uh, that Plato produces so that you can monitor how students are doing in terms of gaining command of the material that they're working towards. And then, then we're done with the slides from the actual uh, software. and. I just simply used to listed what I think in my mind are potential uses for Plato. And, I, and some of this is, is, is repetitive. To fill in identified gaps in skills and knowledge. Kids who are in there for just a short term. They're pretty good math students. They're getting B's and C's or whatever it might be, whatever is acceptable. But they have a hard time with quadratic polynomials. So they go in and they're plugged into quadratic polynomials for a few weeks. Uh, they demonstrate on Plato that they're doing okay, and then hopefully they do better on their certification assessments related to quadratic polynomials. Are there such things as quadratic polynomials? <laughs> I think there might be. Um, I used to be a very good math student, but it's been a long time. Um, credit catch-up, and I mentioned that. Um, summer school, there are actually schools, and Lewiston has just begun this, there are actually schools we're beginning to use Plato as summer school opportunities for students to come in for two or three weeks. I would definitely envision it, uh, for example, the summer be for eighth graders, the summer before students enter the high school, students who need some additional assistance that have been identified. Uh, it's just a wonderful opportunity that I can't imagine that parents would turn down uh, to try something creative and different to get their kids to have a, a head start. Um, adult ed, um, in Lewiston, 
um, Plato is actually a money, they, they actually gain some revenue uh, by charging adults to access Plato as well. Um, and that's done through their adult debt, or in here it would be our community services program. Um, I'm not sure that it would pay for the entire cost of it, but, it, but it's, it's something that would help offset the cost of, of what we have to offer. Students take, they do Plato things for SAT prep, um, and then instead of private tutoring. I don't, and I don't want to, I don't want to overstate and suggest that creation of the Achievement Center will be, mean that there will be no need for private tutoring in Cape Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm that naive, but I think it can, it can help um, fill, fill that need. And for those students in particular who can't afford to be privately tutored, uh, it would be especially uh, helpful. Okay, on the next page, I want to just briefly describe a few other tools in addition to the Plato software um, that I would see located there and used. And the first one is a software program called Accelerated Reader. This is a program that we have right now. There is no cost associated with getting it. We've already got it. Um, An Accelerated Reader basically has two parts. And the first part is a diagnostic tool to give you a snapshot of where the student is as a reader. Fourth grade level, what's their comprehension, what's their fluency, how are they doing? Um, and then the other part of Accelerated Reader is a system um, that <coughs> encourages students using some teacher set and student set and perhaps parent set goals that gives students a motivation to read. Because one of the things that is absolutely true of reading is if you read, you get better. If you don't, you don't. Um, and it gives an incentive for students to read at their interest, at their grade level, and to gradually sort of move up, hopefully, uh, just through practice and through reading to continually to, to show progress and to have gains in comprehension and fluency. The second thing that I am proposing that is part of the budget proposal that I've included is that the school give uh, to all students um, three separate tests, which are created by the same organization that creates the ACT. And for those of you who have parents, who have students who have gone through the high school, you may have heard of the ACT, or your students may have actually taken the ACT. Um, it is a competitor to the SAT. The primary difference, as I understand it, between the ACT and the SAT is that the ACT is more reflective of what students actually learn in their high school courses, whereas the SAT still tends to be more of a test of reasoning, conceptualization, vocabulary, and those sorts of things that are more related to a student's overall achievement and aptitude, not necessarily a measure of what they learn. Um, the ACT is the big test. It's the one that's a competitor of the SAT. Some of our students already taking it take it now. I'm proposing as part of this proposal that we actually subsidize in a small way all of our students to take the ACT. And the reason I'm proposing that is because there is a family of tests that's also created by the same organization. There's Explore, which is given to ninth graders, Plan, which is given to 10th graders, and then the ACT. We do a lot of testing at the high school, but one thing we do not have right now is any external test which is geared to a set of meaningful, fixed academic standards that we can use as a tool to measure students' ongoing progress from ninth grade to 10th grade to 11th grade. Go ahead. Would this then take, this, would this satisfy them the main learning results? No. This is going to be in addition to yes. the Yes. Yes. Yeah, what I would envision is both explore and plan are short tests. I mean, they take um, an hour and a half or something like that. Um, I would envision that while our juniors are taking the MEAs, our ninth and 10th graders would be taking explore and plan. Um, the ACT itself, I would see being taken by students on a sat. Well, those are given, just as the SAT is, those are given on Saturdays and that sort of thing. Um, and I think we could get most, if not all, of our students to take the ACT. Our guidance counselors would love it, um, 
some of our students do better on the ACTs, comparatively speaking, than they do on the SATs, precisely because it's more curriculum and better. Now, um, why are you putting such an import on the ACTs? Is it because, in the end, the students are going to be able to show higher institutions that they that they it will have. It would have. No, that's not. That's not my motivation. Though it would have that benefit um, if students do well and choose to report those grades to the to their colleges. Um, the reason I propose it is because it allows us to have an external measure that demonstrates that our students are progressing at a rate that we would like to see them progress at. Um, right now, that doesn't exist. Uh, the MEAs happen in the 11th grade. Yeah, anything else? Anything more? No, no, none of the local assessments. There's no local assessment? Oh, we have all kinds of local assessments. Well, wouldn't that be a way to gain I'm that? talking about external measures geared towards external standards. Um, and I could go on and on and on and on and on and on about that. Um, and I have at some length in other, other places. Um, and I'd be glad to sort of share my thoughts about that with you if you want, but um, I just see a real validity, um, a greater validity to having at least some external measure of how our kids are doing. Okay. Um, the other services on the next page, um, I think I've just talked about all of them. Um, I will say that I want to vastly understate the last one because I'm not, I'm not, I don't see that as a primary focus or a primary drive, particularly in the beginning years of the Achievement Center. I do see it as a possibility, the idea of doing some limited career planning and perhaps linking students up uh, with men, community mentors, perhaps community tutors who are in particular careers. I may be wrong. It may be that we could get that off the ground right away, uh, but, but um, this is a pretty ambitious proposal as it is, um, and I want to be a little bit cautious about that particular piece of it. Um, I think I've mentioned the next slide, ACE, the Achievement Center will benefit all. Um, it's not just for remediation purposes, although it will certainly serve that purpose. And I believe I've already uh, mentioned each one of these things specifically in, in what I've said so far. I want to jump to the next slide and talk about the Achievement Center staff that I've included in the budget proposal. There is no question in my mind that the most important position that I'm proposing is the first one that is a full-time manager and supervisor who has excellent organizational and computer skills, and as a strong teacher of both students and adults. Um, this is the person who would set up the schedule, set up the system, work with the volunteers who are delivering services, become expert in how the Plato system works, putting all the pieces together, and to some extent involved in direct delivery of services to students. The next position is that I propose as a full-time teacher of YC on a more day-to-day -day basis is responsible for working with students and parents to come up with individual plans, diagnosing where the particular student is, figuring out what services that the Achievement Center has to offer would be appropriate to meet the needs of the particular student, whether it's Play-Doh or writing conferencing or organizational coaching or whatever it might be. Um, so that's two full-time positions. The next position is a position that actually is, is, does not have a budgetary impact. It involves using in the Achievement Center a, a half-time half position that already exists in the high school and bringing that position within the umbrella of the Achievement Center, and that is a half-time certified special ed teacher who has expertise and experience um, and a track record working with kids to help them develop and improve their organizational skills. 
Um, and then the last part is a part-time English teacher. I'm talking about a one-fifth English teacher who can work to train adult volunteers to do conferencing with kids. On the next page, the other equipment and supplies that I proposed in the budget <clears throat> is Play-Doh, obviously. And what I'm proposing is to purchase 10 licenses of Play-Doh. And what, the, what 10 licenses means is that at any given time, you can have up to 10 students using it. You can have a total of 150 students benefiting from it at any given time, but only 10 physically can be on it at any one time. Um, there is the possibility as well, depending on what type of system we were to purchase, if we do get Play-Doh, uh, they have a web-based, web-delivered Play-Doh software license. It's the same cost either way. And they also have a locally hosted Play-Doh software version as well. And I'd want to do, to be honest with you, a little bit more investigation before I before I make a judgment or a recommendation about which way to go, the, night, the advantage of the web-based system is that students could actually access Play-Doh from home, again, subject to the 10 person at a time limit. Uh, the disadvantage, at least as of last year, when we were at Lewis, Lewiston and talking with the person up there who's been in charge of their Play-Doh lab for several years, is that the web-based system, at least as of last year, is a little bit slower. So it can be a little bit frustrating uh, to access. And we don't want it to be frustrating, because otherwise, that's that's important. Um, Twelve computers and a printer, uh, the ACT family of tests, and then some miscellaneous supplies, but not very much. We need twelve computers and twelve the laptop program the property of the school system. That's correct. That's correct. Um, the total amount in terms of staff that I've included in the budget, and I think you've got all those details, or will shortly, is for staff, $105,000. That doesn't count the half-time special ed position, which we really already have right now. Um, for Plato, 10 licenses is $35,000. <clears> for the ACT family of tests, you'll get the detail in the budget narrative. It's between five and $6,000. That's to do all, it's, it's to completely pay for, plan and explore, and it's to partially subsidize the ACT test itself. Um, and then there's some relatively small, less than $10,000, other miscellaneous supplies and equipment and things like that um, that would go into it as well. Um, I have been a critic of standard-based, Actually, I haven't been a critic of standards-based education, but I have been and continue to be a critic of some of the ways that we try to do standards-based education in Maine. But in my mind, one of the good things about standards-based education, even the way we're trying to do it in Maine, is it focuses attention and elevates to a higher priority, to the level, I think, of a near imperative that we put in place some system which will help kids have at least a fair opportunity to learn and on top of that, in this model, would also help kids who are not going to be challenged by the learning results to get more out of themselves um, and to achieve the goals that they and their parents have for them. And that's my presentation. I'm sorry, Finn? Oh, um, that would be, I can't, it would be around $13,000. Yeah, about a thousand. I, I have a precise number in the. I should have brought that number with me here, but it's in that neighborhood. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. 
Um, in terms of how they measure it, um, I can only speak from experience that I'm personally familiar with. Um, uh, when I was a teacher at Mount Ararat High School, uh, we actually created a writing center. It wasn't the full-blown achievement center. It was specifically for writing conferences. And the way we measured how the impact of the writing center was by monitoring our kids' results on number one, their grades that their teachers gave to them, and number two, their MEA scores. Um, and there was a, there's a significant difference. I mean, kids are going to write better if they get more opportunity to talk, to converse, to conference one-on-one -on -one with students about their writing. There's just no question about that. Um, I suspect that if I asked um, different, um, well, let me go back to Plato. Um, to the extent that what's being delivered in the Achievement Center is, is being delivered by Plato, there are very specific results, very specific data that you can generate that says, this is where the kid is, this is where the kid was, and here's the difference. Um, and I would presume, and I would bet that it would be verified, that when a kid no longer needs the support of the Achievement Center, we would have to continue to sort of monitor how the student is doing in, the, in their classes without the support of the Achievement Center. Um, we would be able to see that students who are struggling on certain certification assessments geared to the learning results, who haven't passed it the first time around, they go through the Achievement Center, do they pass it the second time around? Um, what I think the learning results, my guess is that um, until now, and by now I mean the last few years when learning results were put in place, my guess is that a lot of the achievement centers, learning centers, whatever they were, writing centers, whatever they were called, probably were not um, given the same level of uh, scrutiny in terms of their results as we clearly have to do now. Um, it'll be measured by the, whether our students are getting diplomas um, in four years. But it clearly, I mean, accountability is the name of the game in education. Um, and, and that's where it's going, and there's no way to avoid it. And I think there's plenty of tools built within this system to ensure that. Uh, the next time we provide by Plato, uh, those districts that have put into place their program and the um, measure of improvement that they have seen, I think that would be useful to look at. Yes, they, and I have. I didn't bring those with me today. Um, yes, they, there is there are there's research that they've done. Uh, there are anecdotal stories of what happened with individual schools when they implemented the Plato system. Yep. And I I can I can get whatever you'd like. I'll just say I don't have any questions. Yet. This is the third time. I've <laughs> for you. <laughs> yep. But uh, I, I can say, as a school board uh, representative or an educational advisor on the uh, Education Foundation, um, it's first, I've been very impressed with the work that they've done in working with the district leadership team and identifying those types of things that would take our school to our vision um, that we can't necessarily, as a school board, do all on our own at this particular time in, in our community. Um, and I've just been very excited about hearing how the support of, um, of not only Tom and, and Nancy to allowing the high school to go forward with this, but the idea that a successful model and some results will eventually bring those benefits to their schools also, so that we so be a K through 12 kind of beneficial thing for our students. And I think that Jeff's put a lot of time and researched a lot of um, centers. And I just, I'm excited at the fact that we can do something um, not halfway, that we have the potential to do something the right way the first time. And from naming the center to, um, to getting all the students, not just the remedial students. I think that's the most important thing that we're seeing here that will bring long-term benefits and success. So I, I'll, I just say I support this at 110%. I'm just really excited, and I really hope the rest of the school board um, sees the benefits. And I'd be glad to answer any questions after. I know um, Patty and the Education Foundation um, can answer questions later on as time goes on when it comes to 
funding, we'll see um, the budget and we'll see what Bob has come up with as the way to make this a possibility so that we can work together with to see if the school board so decides to go forward with this. I am very supportive of the issue in the I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, time has come for lots of reasons. Um, I think where I'm having difficulty is understanding where at the ACTs are necessarily part and parcel of an achievement center. Um, so in future conversations or discussions, I would like to see perhaps that link be made a little bit clearer for me. Um, otherwise, I think this is an outstanding proposal. And um, I think we we'll see more specifics. Have you put together a detailed budget plan? Yes. And I believe I saw something, some documentation generated by CIF along the same lines? It was reflected on the budget. Okay. My suggestion is, and uh, you know, I certainly defer to the superintendent and you, but I think it would be a good idea for the members of the board to see that budgetary information as soon as possible. Um, so that we're not seeing it for the first time when the proposal is represented as strictly as a budgetary item. Um, so if there are any questions in there, we can begin to um, develop those questions and ask those questions. Um, as for myself, I, like Elaine, have participated in conversations like this more times than I care to remember and for financial considerations only, I have had to vote against such proposals in the past. Um, this proposal is right. It's the right time. It's the right place, except for um, the financial issue. However, um, regardless of the financial issue, we must do something now. And I believe that you'll find I am in complete support um, of the uh, the framework of the proposal, and I also want to thank CIF. Um, I know that their their contribution to this is predicated on our commitment to this program, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to deliver that commitment in the very near future. Is there anything else from anyone? Thank you very much. If not, this hearing is over. Thank you all for coming tonight.